February the 27th, 2004, Altendorf, Switzerland. It is 4.15 p.m. on a chilly day, and two young ladies are headed to a travel agency in town to book a vacation. But when they arrive at the travel agents, they see nobody inside. Confused, one of the girls assumes that perhaps the shop is shut, despite the door being open. Her friend, however, argues otherwise. The two then skim through a few brochures to pass the time, but after a while, with still no staffer in sight, they decide to have a look around. This is when they notice a handbag, which had very obviously been dropped on the floor in a hurry. Its inside splattered across the floor. The bag was sat just below one of the desks. The girls call out, but nobody answers. Then, they proceed to walk towards the back of the agency, and this is when they see two thick red stains on the floor leading to a back room. They panic and leave. What they don't know? In the other room lies a dead woman, and that young woman's name is Patricia Wilhelm. 22-year-old Patricia Wilhelm lived in the municipality of Einsiedeln in Switzerland. Einsiedeln is situated in the valley of the Alp River and has a population of around 16,000. Einsiedeln is a very scenic place, really lovely for relaxing walks. And in Switzerland, it is mostly known for its monastery, the Kloster Einsiedeln, which was established in the 10th century. And Patricia lived in Einsiedeln with her boyfriend in a house owned by her boyfriend's mother, who also lived at the property. Patricia herself loved sports. She was very athletic and especially liked to dance. Together with her best friend Monica, she was a member of the local dance club and regularly went out for a dance. Patricia also had a boyfriend who she actually was planning to marry sometime that year. Professionally, Patricia was working at a travel agency in Talvil, a position she was actually looking to leave in the coming weeks. Not long ago, she had been approached by her former employer, who remembered her fondly, and she was offered the position of deputy travel agent. Not only had she completed her apprenticeship at Aero Tours, and hence knew the place really well, she was ecstatic to be offered a deputy position at only 22 years old. It was a big deal, so she readily accepted. On January 26, 2004, Patricia left her home in Einsiedeln and traveled to Altendorf for her first day of work. Altendorf is a 22-minute drive from Einsiedeln and has a population of 7,000, so a tad smaller than her hometown. And her first day back at her old workplace went really well. Her old boss sat down with her to reintroduce her to all the tasks and she was really excited to have Patricia on board. Specifically, because she'd finally be able to take some much needed time off of work and leave Patricia to sort of run the company in her absence. Her manager described Patricia as someone who was very valued by the firm. She was competent, friendly and always content. Very easy to work with and someone clients just talk to. Three weeks later, with her manager off to Mauritius with her husband, Patricia is left to handle the agency on her own. At the time, she only had Lucas, an apprentice who was one year her junior, for company. The first day without her manager progressed smoothly. That is until Patricia, as part of her daily tasks, decided to count the money in the agency's till and realized that 200 francs had been missing. She asked Lucas whether he knew anything about it and he said that he only took out 30 Swiss francs and he was adding the receipt to prove that later. But before he could show her the receipt or discuss this any further, he got a call from a few mates and decided to call it a day, 20 minutes early. And Patricia, being nice as she is, she just signed off on this. On Tuesday, February the 24th, Patricia called her bestie Monica, who was vacationing in Australia at the time. The conversation began with Patricia complaining about Lucas. She said he was incredibly frustrating to work with, he just would not listen to her despite her being in charge. 
Monica remarked that perhaps this had to do something with their age gap. Remember, they were only one year apart. Shortly after, the conversation took a turn. Monica quickly sensed that something else was bothering Patricia. She seemed visibly downcast. Patricia agreed and said that something was indeed troubling her. But just as she was opening up and about to tell Monica what that was, her boyfriend arrived home from work. The girls then agreed to chat again on Thursday, and Patricia would then explain everything. But that call, for reasons unknown, never happened. Three days later, on February the 27th, Patricia is in the kitchen with her boyfriend's mother. That morning, she wasn't feeling very well, and she could feel herself coming down with something. Her boyfriend's mother asked her to stay at home, but Patricia said that there is no one else at work, not even Lucas who was at school, so she didn't really have a choice but to go in. Her boyfriend then joined them and gave Patricia her mobile phone, saying that she got a text message. At first glance, she didn't recognize the number, but when she read the text, she realized that it's from Giselle, a girl she went to vocational school with. Patricia had recently bumped into Giselle and her boyfriend René at a club at the end of 2003. The two chatted for a bit, having not seen each other in two years, and decided to be in touch soon before René came up to Giselle and quite sternly told her that it's time to leave. In the text, Giselle said that she had broken up with René and that she was now having serious issues with him. She then asked Patricia to please not share her new number with either her ex or his friends. René was actually really close friends with Lucas, the apprentice. Patricia said that she didn't really know René personally, but that she had met him that night at the club and he came across as really hostile. She told her boyfriend's mother that she could very well imagine him being a burden. Patricia then headed out and opened shop as expected at 9am. Everything went well until at 2.56pm, while alone at work, Patricia tried to ring her manager, who was still vacationing in Mauritius, but her manager didn't pick up. Patricia then left a message saying, quote, Hello Vera, it's Patricia. I'm sorry I am interrupting your vacation. Please call me back later, it's very urgent. Thanks, bye. At 3.15pm, a passerby who knew Patricia from seeing her around town walked past the travel agency. He saw Patricia sitting at her desk and the pair waved at each other. Then, sometime in the next 30 minutes, Patricia is shot at twice from very close proximity, and she dies. When police arrived at the scene, they realized that the agency's till, which had around 1,000 Swiss francs in it, was gone. Also gone were Patricia's purse and her notebook, the latter which contained addresses and phone numbers. As is typical for Swiss investigations, not a lot has been shared with media with regards to the investigation that followed. However, in August of 2019, the lead investigator and the prosecutor in charge of the case were guests on a German television program called Aktenzeichen XY. The show seeks to solve regional crimes, and this was only the second Swiss case to be covered on the show. Aktenzeichen XY is not only highly popular throughout the Dach region, but also has a success rate of over 40%, which is quite incredible. The reason they came on the show, they said, is because they believe that there are witnesses or people who know what happened that haven't spoken to police. Another reason they wanted this aired internationally was that they believe that the perpetrator may no longer live in Switzerland. And they have a very good reason for believing that. At the crime scene, they were able to secure two cartridge cases which were not issued in Switzerland. According to the investigators, they had thoroughly looked into the case. They had questioned countless people and obtained the alibis of more than 1,300 people, without any success. The early stages of the investigation, they said, proved extremely difficult, especially because authorities struggled to decide on the motive. At the beginning, all the signs pointed to a robbery-motivated murder. But the more they looked into it, the more they began to think that this might be a crime of passion instead 
and the reason they shifted to that view was the following. First, the crime scene. Altendorf is a small place, but the travel agency, which has since been closed, was situated on a very busy road in the middle of the town. For a robbery, this would have been a risky target. Then, there was the time. Patricia was shot at around 4 p.m., which according to the investigator, was not a usual time for a robbery. Also, there was the money. A robber typically plans ahead and all the shop had was 1,000 Swiss francs, around 780 US dollars. That's peanuts. Had they wanted to make big money, they'd have waited for a better time to hit. The investigator also remarked on the crime scene itself. Patricia was found in a back room, to which she was dragged, as was evident by the streaks of blood on the floor. But why drag her there? Normally, if a robbery goes out of hand, a burglar is much more likely to shoot and flee the scene, especially during the early stages of rush hour. In Switzerland, people normally work until 5 p.m. She was murdered at 4 p.m., a busy time on a main road. But this robber didn't simply shoot and run. He took the time to hide her and then take her notebook. Why? The last point that concerned them was that the way the two shots were fired indicated a deliberate killing. The investigators then said that the two calls, one to Monica and one to her manager that Patricia made, as well as their subsequent investigation, indicated that not everything was rosy in her life. However, they didn't think that whatever troubles she had were severe enough to drive anyone to murder. Having secured the cartridge cases at the crime scene, authorities were then faced with another unusual issue. The cases were not only foreign, but 70 years old. And they weren't even the same. One of them was issued in 1956 in former Yugoslavia, the other in 1952 in Czechoslovakia. The bullet cases were also matched with a standard weapon, which was used by the Czechoslovakian military forces at the time. Forensics also searched the travel agency for any possible DNA, and they were able to locate DNA on Patricia's clothing and the shelf in the back office. And when those two DNA traces were compared, they were not a match. They came from two different people. The lead investigator stated that they did of course immediately compare the DNAs found to every male in Patricia's inner circle, as well as any male they had found to have been in contact with her. Nobody was a match. The investigator said that although Patricia had been shot with two different bullets, and there had been two different DNA traces located, they are 100% sure that both bullets were fired from the same weapon by the same person. That is not to say that the other person wasn't also standing there. The missing items that disappeared at the crime scene have never resurfaced, nor has anyone ever tried to use any of Patricia's credit cards. In 2004, police offered a reward of 5,000 Swiss francs to be paid to any individual that leads them to solving the case. The reward still stands. After the episode featuring Patricia's case aired on Aktenzeichen XY, one person who had been watching called in to say that they recognized the bullet cases and they linked them to a German double murder that occurred in 1998. Additionally, several other leads flew in and Swiss authorities confirmed that they are looking into all of them last year. And that is all there is known about this case. No further updates have been provided by Swiss police, but that isn't to say that they aren't working hard behind the scenes to hopefully bring justice for Patricia. As always, thank you for watching Gators and see you next week with another one. Bye!